Hi guys, let's resume. Can you hear me fine? Yeah. Okay, let's go to airway management now. I'm not saying nurses straight out of graduation is going to intubate. We don't intubate. We do initiate, however, when a patient needs to be intubated. First of all, let's get uh, something straight here. Mechanical ventilation, which will follow intubation, is not going to cure respiratory failure or ARDS. This again is only supportive therapy, right? So this is what we call life support. So the patient, for one reason or another, is unable to meet their oxygenation needs. Therefore, we intubate them and put them on a mechanical ventilator. Other reasons for intubation is uh, for surgery, for instance, when a patient is undergoing general surgery, I mean uh, receiving general anesthesia, because these anesthetics uh, will depress the respiratory system as well as we don't want the patient moving during surgery. Uh, of course, we can't have the slightest twitch of the patient, for instance, may cause severe damage to the, um, what was I saying? Sorry, I got distracted by a message. Um, oh, uh, yeah, yeah. So a patient requiring uh, major surgery will be given general anesthesia plus succinyl cooling. So the patient is paralyzed, therefore that will paralyze all muscles, including the breathing muscle. So therefore we need to intubate the patient and put them on a ventilator. Others are if a patient's unconscious, cannot protect their airway. So those are s just some of the reasons. And of course, related to chapter 32, patients in respiratory failure or ARDS are intubated. So the patient needed intubation and then you called respiratory uh, rapid, re rapid response and then they agreed with you, yes, we will intubate your patient. Uh, so now you just prepare um, the way, you know, clear the room and then let the people come in, do their job. <clears throat> if possible, take the, uh, if it's a semi-private room, take the other patient out of the room. That way they don't have to watch this or listen to all of the rockers because it can be scary. Uh, and then just provide the team with whatever they need. <clears throat> However, since this is your patient, you will have to take care of this moving forward. Meaning once the team have done their job, the patient's now intubated, now you have to take care of the airway. You have to manage the airway, make sure it stays patent, make sure the airway is in the right place, make sure the airway is secure, make sure the airway, uh, you have a tight seal okay, around, the, around the trachea. We'll discuss all these shortly. Uh, let's begin with what are airways? All right, so this is where the tube is going to be uh, located. So the your physician, the respiratory therapist, or the anesthesiologist will put in a, a we use rapid sequence intubation now, very non-traumatic, very peaceful. Unlike before, uh, now the, the protocol is you have to sedate the patient to give them rocuronium. And um, so that's a few seconds. The patient's already unconscious and uh, totally relaxed. Then we put the laryngoscope in, and then we put the tube in. Now it's in place. Peaceful, so we can get the intubation in under 90 seconds, okay? Next comes the, um, we have two things to do. We have to make sure the airway is in the right place, because as you can see, we have two tubes here. We have the trachea, and then we also have the esophagus. So we have to make sure, did we put the airway in the right uh, hole? Uh, there's two ways to do that. One is to...
this one. There are two ways to do it. We get an x-ray. However, when uh, as soon as the x-ray is done, it'll, it'll be several minutes before we get the results. The, the x-ray tech has to wheel it down back to the radiology. He has to develop the film. He has to show it to the radiologist. Radiologists have to read it, and then you get the results. So that would be uh, a good at least 10 minutes. So you can't sit there or you can't stand there bagging the patient the whole time. So you have to have the other way in order to confirm it. The other way is to check the end tidal CO2 level. So this is a device called a capnometer, which is a sensor. So you put it at the tip of the tube. You put it here. I oh, know here, here. You put the sensor here. And then you read your capnometer. What it was it reading? Is it uh, is the CO two level normal or high? If it's normal or high, then you have you, you got to be in the uh, trachea because the stomach won't have that high of a CO2 content. It will be a little bit, but never normal or never high. So if you have that, then, then you're sure that it's in the trachea, and then you can continue bagging the patient. However, we need the x-ray in order to see where is the, the tip located. The tip has to be in the bifurcation <coughs> between the left and right main stem bronchi. It should be two centimeters um, right here. So the tip has to be two centimeters above the carina. So this is again the bifurcation wherein your main stem bronchus divides to become the right and the left main stem bronchi. If you compare it to your body and your right leg is your right main stem bronchus and the left leg is the left main stem bronchus, that would make your carina would be your crotch. All right? So the tip of the tube must be two centimeters above the carina. It must not be too deep <coughs> uh, because you need air in order to for air to... Uh, properly enter the right and the left main stem bronchi. If it's in too deep, most likely the ET tube will end up in the right main stem bronchus because of the anatomical shape of the right main stem bronchus, which is more straight compared to the left. The left is more tilted toward at, at an angle, so it's uh, almost impossible to put the tube there. However, again, the right main stem bronchus is straight so therefore, when you put the tube in there, it's most likely going to go straight into the right. So again, we, we need to verify placement of the tube, one, by detecting for the presence of CO2 right here. And then we wait for the x-ray confirmation to see where is the tube. If it's confirmed that it's two centimeters above the carina, then that's it. What if it's not? Uh, no problem. So you see the tube here has markings. We have uh, numbers here. So you can simply mark where is it at the teeth. We usually use the teeth, the, the patient's incisors, or if the patient has no teeth, then we use the lip. Either way, you mark it and then you document where is the tip. So later when we get to the, when we get the x-ray result, the doctor will tell you uh, if it's not in place, he will tell you how much to pull it by. Okay, so he'll tell you um, the tube needs to be pulled uh, one centimeters um, up. So, uh, and then the whoever is managing their way will pull it up, and then there's our confirmation, right? Now, next is we have to seal this because this thing, we don't just tape it around the secure it at the mouth we also have to seal this part right here so if this is our you can see the screen right so if this is our cuff can you see me drawing no 
Yeah, I see you drawing. You're yeah. drawing inside the esophagus. Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. All right. Very good. So it, once, once this is inserted, the cuff, of course, was still flat. Now we need to, to um, inflate this so that we seal it because we want the air only to go in and out through the tube. We can't have it leaking around here, around the sides. So it has to be sealed in order for the air to, for your oxygenation to be adequate. Because if you're, if it's loose, then two things can happen. One, you you don't you have leak. So the let's say you measure tidal volume to be 400 milliliters of air with each breath. The patient's not going to get 400 ml because most of it will be leaking around. Because remember, the patient, especially if the patient has a stiff lung, uh, you decrease compliance. It'll be very hard to ventilate that. So if there's high pressure, of course, the air will leak around. So we don't want that leaking around. So we have to seal the trachea with the intertracheal tube top. Now, we also have to know how much do I inflate it with. So therefore, whoever intubated this patient will have to put the stethoscope here and then listen. So this is the person. Okay, uh, list, they listen and then they put a syringe here. They connect a syringe. So this, this thing here is called the pilot balloon. It will be uh, inflated if the cuff is inflated. If it's deflated, that means the cuff is also deflated. That's all it does. It just tells you, oh, there's air in the cuff. However, it, won't, it can't tell you how much air is in there. So what we do is, so we put the stethoscope here. Now the whole time, somebody's bagging this patient. So there will be a ambu bag here. <coughs> It is the reservoir, so the shape would be like this. So the, the, the nurse will be somebody bagging this patient, giving the patient breaths while we're doing this. So as the, if the cuff is still deflated, of course, the person listening to this will hear a lot of air leak. So as the person ba is bagging, so air is going into the patient's lung, and then there will be a lot of leak because you have, uh, you, the, the cuff is still deflated. So what, what this person will do, so let's say this is um, Brianna. So Brianna is listening to the neck. So at first she'll hear a lot of air leak. However, she will slowly inflate this with air until she will no longer hear that leak. So she only inflates it with the minimum necessary in order to eliminate the leak. So once she hears no more leak, she stops inflating it. And then after that, she will now connect a manometer here, which is like a tire, tire pressure gauge um, um, device. You know, when you put a, when you measure the air in your tires, you put a, uh, what, do you, what do you call that thing? Um, yeah, tire pressure gauge, right? So this is called a manometer. So you connect that to the tip here, and then you press the trigger and it will tell you how much air is in there, how much pressure you have in there. The pressure should be between 20 to 30 centimeters of water or 14 to 20 millimeters of mercury. I'll show you where to find these numbers shortly. So as soon as we have that, so we we inflated the cuff until we heard no more leak. We take off the syringe. We put this gauge here and we press the trigger. If our tracheal pressure, inflation pressure, the cuff inflation pressure rather, is between this or this, then we're good. Because if it's under this or over this, if it's under, that means we most likely will have a leak. If it's too much, we most likely are causing too much pressure and compression over the vessels on the trachea. Remember the trachea, although it has connective tissue, it also has blood supply. We don't want to cause tracheal ischemia. It may cause uh, uh, tracheal necrosis. 
So this is the only safe pressures for the data. All of us have different sized tracheas. We don't know exactly, but based on evidence, we know that if the pressures are within this or this, it will not cause tracheal necrosis. So now we have uh, inflated in the tracheal cuff. We have no more leak, and also the secretions that will go down here be no longer and trachea because now we have a seal here so the patient won't aspirate anymore. So all secretions will go straight down the legs. <clears throat> and then now we can safely put this patient on a mechanical ventilator. And then we just monitor the patient pressure periodically because the airway size does change. You know, uh, there's inflammation there so it may grow smaller, grow bigger. So we need to monitor for leaks every now and then. Any question on this part? Professor, when the airway is blocked through intubation, what happens with the CO2 levels? Say again, sir. When, it, when, when the patient's intubated, like does the CO2 levels increase in the patient? Uh, no, because we have, um, the patient does, uh, does exhale passively, meaning this is now connected to the ventilator and the vent will give them a breath and then gently stop giving a breath during the exhalation phase. So inhalation, the vent gives a breath. Exhalation uh, is, continues to be passive, meaning the, the vent simply stops giving a breath and then the patient's able to exhale passively. Mm, Did okay. I answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Okay. All right, so now we have intubated the patient. We confirm placement by detecting for ETCO2 levels, as well as x-ray confirmation, telling us that it's two centimeters above the carina. And now we've also inflated the endotracheal cuff to a correct pressure in order to Prevent the uh, prevent any air leaks as well as to prevent any aspiration. Now we need to secure it. Uh, right now we're still holding this. We haven't taped it yet to the patient. So all we have is the marking. So somebody will document the the number. So what number is it at the patient's teeth or at the patient's lip? So the technique we used earlier on uh, that Brianna used to, to listen to the neck while inflating the cuff is called the minimal lead technique. So the, we inflated the cuff to have an adequate ceiling volume where you only have a minimum amount of air that can pass around it, if, if anything. And of course, uh, <clears throat> the patient shouldn't be able to talk if the cuff is inflated. So this will be your cue. If the patient is able to make sounds, <clears throat> or worse, they're talking to you, your cuff is not inflated. There's no seal, and which is dangerous. That means the patient could be aspirating this whole time. So you need to fix that. Uh, okay. This is the verifying case. Uh, there are other ways to wait in order to verify placement. So uh, while waiting for the x-ray, you can also, besides checking for entitled CO2 levels, you can also see, uh, as long as there's no sun over the stomach, meaning when you listen to the stomach, there's no air there and the stomach is not rising and falling, but instead it's the chest that is rising and falling, that's good. So the air is going into the lungs, not into the stomach. Uh, you can also hear uh, air from the tube if you remove the, the patient from the vent or you, when you remove the ambu bag, you can hear air coming out of the tube. So that means it's in there. Um, okay. Now, stabilizing the tube. We used to tape them, like literally tape, but now the better practice is to use Velcro. We have 
commercial tube holders which are way better than anything because tape will loosen eventually. These patients will drool, they'll sweat, they'll cry, we have snot. Basically the tape gets wet. When it gets wet, it's going to, of course, it's going to loosen. And now we have a loose tube which can move around and might be displaced. So we have to use the commercial tube holders. They're made of Velcro, so they're pretty stable. And another thing is when we put too much adhesive on the patient's skin, of course, that will cause skin breakdown. You may or you may not use a bite block. Um, I don't routinely use a bite block because um, sometimes when the patient um, gets anxious and they start, they, they can bite on it and um, you know, may, may damage their, their teeth. Uh, although not likely because that's really uh, foam. Uh, however, um, even if they bite the ET tube, at least I know, you know there's something wrong and then the, the alarm will go off, the high pressure alarm will be triggered and then I can, I can know what's going on. Rather than if there's a bite block, <coughs> um, the patient won't be able to bite the tube because the patient biting the ET tube will be my cue that they're restless, for instance, they're in pain, so I can go check them out, right? But if you prefer bite blocks, go ahead. Okay, here's a acronym for things that can go wrong with your airway. So uh, acronym is DOPE. So if the airway can be displaced, it can be obstructed. Uh, and that's your cue for uh, suctioning. A right, patient may have a pneumothorax, which we'll talk about later in the chapter, that, or it could be a vent problem. Uh, here's the number. However, there's another place where you can see the pressure. Uh, 629, let's go to, I think it's fine. In chapter 28. Please go to chapter 28. Okay, chapter 28. Page 539. <clears throat> so uh, I mentioned 20 and 30 centimeters water uh, or 14 and 20 millimeters of mercury. Right? Again, this is the purpose of inflating the cuff, the endotracheal cuff to no more than these is to prevent tissue damage, particularly the ischemia, uh, ischemia uh, to, the, to the trachea. Right? And then we need to seal again. Uh, that way there's no aspiration and we have optimal oxygen delivery. So this is the manometer I mentioned earlier. So it's not really the, the same as the tire gauge indicator that you guys use. So you'll find this on a bag hanging on the ventilator. So there'll be one in there uh, for you to use. Another is to, um, okay, the patient's oxygen will be warm, that's humidified. So there will be a setup uh, from the oxygen source going to the vent. So you'll have a, the air will go through the ventilator and while in there, it will be warmed. Uh, and then as it exits, it will also go through a humidifier. There will be a bottle of humidifier there. And that way you won't have any coughing because a cold air as well as a dry air will cause, of course, coughing. So it will uh, trigger the cough reflex, very uncomfortable for your patient. <clears throat> this will also help um, avoid the dry secretions, which is, of course, we'll have to deal with secretions here. The presence of the ET tube 
in the trachea, it's a foreign object, of course, it will trigger the production of mucus. So as long as this patient has the plastic airway in there, they will have to be suctioned, okay? Because there will be nonstop secretions being produced. The next is uh, suction, and I'll go back to chapter 32. Because the patient has a plastic airway again, they have to be suctioned. How often do we suction? As needed. All right, only as needed. There should be no routine suctioning, all right? I remember my short um, hustle with a nursing home. We had a protocol of routine suctioning. So the patient, regardless, was suctioned once a shift. So the patient was suctioned three times a shift. And these are chronic patients, though. They're not... Uh, I can understand... Uh, acute patients in the ICU, but these are long-term care patients, so there really was no need to suction because, for one thing, these patients have the airway, they have the tracheostomy forever, and these patients pretty much are good with expectorating the secretions on their own. I mean, they can cough them out through the tube. All you have to do is just clean the tip. But they had this um, protocol, so even if the patient didn't really need it, we still had to suction. Okay, so that's what uh, was really, um, no, I, I didn't agree with it. <clears throat> anyway, so indication. So we said suctioning is as needed. We have to know when, when is that as needed. These are the indications. You hear audible or noisy secretions, crackles, or a patient's restless, and then you confirm with ABG, patient has hypoxemia or hypercarbia then you, you have the indications. There are another list back in chapter 32. Uh, I just want to refer you to this part because the best practice for suctioning is here, chart 28-2. So only um, as needed, okay? So no, no unnecessary routine suctioning. So wash hands, blah, blah, blah. All right, because this patient is hypoxemic, there was a reason why you suction. There was uh, either hypoxemia or a patient has uh, restlessness, for instance, all indicating that there is uh, poor oxygenation. So now you suction them. The suctioning procedure will cause more hypoxemia because now you're putting a catheter into the only airway they have and blocking it. So therefore, this procedure will actually cause more hypoxemia. So to lessen the impact of the procedure, the damage that you're causing to the patient, pre-oxygenate between 30 seconds to three minutes. When they stay at least three hyperinflations here, this is in the case of you don't have the oxygen, but you're manually bagging the patient. So that's what they mean by three hyperinflations. So if you're using a ambu bag, you put, uh, you give them three large breaths, right before the procedure. Then quickly insert. Quickly means quickly. So you put that tube in there. Uh, you know when to stop when it comes out of the patient's rectum. No, of course when you when you insert the catheter, it will stop because you will you will meet resistance. That resistance that means you've already hit the carina. So after you hit the carina, stop inserting, we draw the catheter, 0.4 to 0.8 of an inch, one to two centimeters, and then start suction. Now a reminder, this is the latest for the ninth edition, and I already looked at the coming 10th edition, coming in the fall. It also says continuous suction. I know we learned intermittent suction in fundamentals. I remember because I taught fundamental lab some time ago, yeah. Um, the, the Iggy, I mean, the Potter and Perry textbook did say intermittent. However, we have here your med search book saying continuous. Uh, the same thing, never suction more than 10, 15 seconds. And then right afterwards, before you rinse the catheter, you should replace the oxygen. Continue hyperoxygenating the patient. Take care of your rinsing your catheter uh, later, okay? 
take care of the oxygenation first. So while the patient recovers, the patient, uh, of course, the color turned purple while you were suctioning, and then now the color is coming back, so you're rinsing the catheter, and the oxygen is uh, being delivered. Now, uh, you can repeat the procedure up to three only. So you can do three passes of the same catheter. After that, you have to change catheter. If the patient somehow needs more suctioning, which is rare, um, you can get another catheter now, but the same catheter must be only used up to three passes. Uh, suctioning the mouth, no problem. You can suction them uh, as often as necessary. There's really no uh, contraindication. And then aftercare. Any question on the review of this catheter procedure? And that's 539 to 541. Let's go back to 628. Professor, just to make sure you're staying with continuous suction, right, for um, test purposes? Yes, that's, yeah, that's what our textbook says. Hold on. All right, we're back on chapter 32 now. So we suction the catheter. So we, um, we verified tube placement. We ensured proper concentration, we stabilized the tube, and now we're maintaining a patent airway. So how to maintain a patent airway, of course, that indicates suction. All right. Let's go now to uh, best practice when caring for a patient who has an airway and is connected to a mechanical ventilator. Chart 32-9 is your best practice. So this covers most of them. Uh, however, complications are not mentioned here, as well as other details. Right, just like any other patient, this is a critical care patient because they are intubated. So you assess vital signs more often than regular patients. So this is every four at least. Look at the patient's color. We're, of course, we're looking at perfusion here. Is there good oxygenation? Do they look like it? chest check for your lung sounds your chest expansion and this one like I said the tube can move can migrate uh, especially when we're moving the patient let's say we are turning them to clean doo-doo or we're changing position from left to right or when we're doing oral care so the tube will move um, so make sure it's still in the right place if you doubt then check cough inflation pressure check for placement, but use the cupnometer again. Do you still have the normal or high CO2 levels in there? Okay, to, to check placement. It's, it's never a one-time thing. You, you, you do these, again, these are your main responsibilities. All right, um, verifying tube placement, um, maintaining proper cuff inflation pressure, maintaining a patent airway, okay, and then securing the tube. Those are your routine management of a patient's airway. Yes, sir. Yes, Moss. The tube on the near the lip is not connected to anything, right? Say again, the the tube, uh, the tracheal tube is uh, on near the lip. Is is it connected to some uh, somewhere, or it's just leave it like the tube itself? What do you mean by it's not connected to where? Is it connected to the gas? Uh, or like uh, it's connected to the ventilator or something? Yes. She saw so, another part that's so, connected to the bag. Right. So yeah. if, if it's like that, so if we know that uh, whether the tube is displaced or something, does the ventilator make sound? So is that the indication of the tube? Displaced? Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about those later. Um, you're referring to alarms, yes. We'll talk about those shortly. Okay. All right. So the position of the patient must be uh, 30 degrees or 45 degrees. 45, remember, you have to weigh the risk and benefits here because when you go higher than 45, that means there's shear already. There's high shear on the patient's sacrum. So that will be, that's going to cause um, pressure injuries. Um, 
if you also put them too low, the patient may aspirate. So best thing would be about 30 to 45 degrees. And uh, also aspiration is related to ventilator-associated pneumonia. We'll discuss this a little bit later, or maybe in history. Vent settings must be checked every eight hours or often as uh, more often as needed. We cannot silence the alarms anymore. You can maybe for two minutes maximum, but after that you you can um, uh, it won't let you silence it for more than two minutes. So that's the longest you can mute it uh, for purposes of. Um, a suctioning the patient because the alarms will go off during suctioning so you, you, you may need to silence it. Okay, okay. this part here, ventilate, empty ventilator tubings. So remember earlier I said the, the air, the oxygen is uh, the oxygen is warmed and humidified, right? Right. So here, let's say this is the patient. And this is the vent right here. So we have two circuits. Two circuits go into the patient. And this is the T2, TPs. All right. So you have a dependent area here. So there will be some water that will collect here because of the humidifier and the, um, the warmed air. So the circuit is only clean, it's not sterile. And we don't routinely change the circuit. The circuit is that blue accordion tube, if you know what I'm saying, uh, delivering the air into the patient. So there will be some secretions here over several hours. So you need to empty that. You need to, you can't put it back into the cascade because we don't know how long this moisture has been there. So that will be dirty. So you can't put back here, nor can you, of course, you can't put it into your patient or aspirate. So simply disconnect them from the circuit from the patient and just drain it somewhere into a or whatever. So drain it there and then throw it away. Okay, so that's what it means. So if you see this one, the moisture collects, do not empty it back to the cascade, right? Okay, so again, ensure proper cuff inflation. Uh, make sure your oxygen is humidified and warm. Uh, routinely listen to your lung sounds. Um, we check the need for suctioning every two hours. This is only checking, but we still suction as needed. Again, we check if the patient needs suctioning routinely every two hours, but then we only suction as needed. Now, we do mouth care every two hours. Mouth care is done using your Q care tips. Let me show you a picture. You've probably seen them already. <clears throat> so, this is a Q care kit. There are four in each kit. Can you see this? Uh, it says Surfinity Medical. 
this one? Yes. Or, okay. So there are four. There's one toothbrush. Uh, here, here's a toothbrush, and then the others are two sets. So there are four you can use. That means you have to do use one every eight hour shift. Now your manager would count these. But she of course orders supplies for the unit. So she will know how much she ordered and she will calculate how many bed days did the unit have. Bed days are calculated by the number of agents times how many days. So every week she would check her inventory and see are the nurses using them. Because this is one of the core measures for preventing ventilator associated pneumonia. So uh, uh, of course um, that means if you're using uh, care kits, you should see a decline in air supply. If air supply stays high, that means are the nurses using them? Of course not. So that means what will the patients now have? Patients will now develop pneumonia and that will be reflected in the record of how many uh, pneumonia cases do we have on the unit? Okay, and then you'll get a long sermon during your powwow in the morning. So you'll be, your manager will chew you out because that's really uncalled for, right? You're supposed to do every two hour mouth care. And of course, you move the tube. The tube mustn't be in the same place because that is a hard plastic tube. It can cause pressure ulcers, so you need to move it from side to side. So perfect time when you do your mouth care every two hours. So you also move the tube every two hours as well as you, you turn the patient side to side also every two hours. Now this is not tracheostomy suctioning, it is tracheostomy care. The patient will be on a trach if they are on a vent for longer than 14 days. It's somewhere in the chapter. Uh, I forgot to point that out earlier. If the patient needs to be on a vent for longer than 10 to 14 days, the patient will be switched to a tracheostomy. Uh, there are many benefits to a trach because the patient can now talk, they can eat, they can ambulate. Uh, versus if they're on an ET tube, if it's an endotracheal tube, the patient usually is sedated. So therefore, the, the uh, recovery will be prolonged. Okay, we know turning them. Uh, we try to give them rest. Of course, a critical care unit is very busy. It's so noisy. We don't want them to be fatigued and also they go into psychosis. Have you ever heard of ICU psychosis? That is a natural phenomenon after long periods of uh, sleep deprivation, which happens in the ICU. So try to give them rest. Don't um, you know, necessarily um, bug the patient if you don't need to. Uh, we'll discuss all the complications later in the chapter. Positioning the patient. If your facility can't prone the patient, then the best thing we can do is put the patient in a good lung down position. So that's literally, if the patient has a left pneumonia, then you put the patient on the right side. Back, right side, back, right side. This is to promote expansion and drainage of the bad lung via gravity. Of course, we don't anticipate this patient to be on the ventilator forever. So we monitor readiness to wean every day. There will be what's called a breathing trial, spontaneous breathing trial, um, to see if the patient can be weaned off the ventilator. Because the longer they stay on it, then the, the harder it is to wean the patient um, eventually. Uh, please read the rest. Okay. Of course, the patient on the vent must be given sedatives, they'll be given pain medications to, um, of course, for comfort. Whenever there's something about communication here, 
um, besides this one. This, uh, I don't see it right now, but um, the communication here, this is for the patient. You give them communication boards or a Ouija board, I don't care, whatever you use just to, for the patient to have a method of communication. Of course, this is only possible if the patient is no longer I mean, uh, sedated, uh, meaning they're either uh, being weaned or maybe they have a trach, uh, in which case they're no longer intubated and the trach is not penetrated so they can't talk. Um, what I also wanted to say is, if the patient is sedated, please continue to talk to the patient. Do not act as if they're not there, or don't act as if they're just a piece of specimen, all right? You need to make sure you continue to talk with the patient, because it is true that they can hear you. As far as whether or not all of them remember, I'm not sure, um, but yeah. I've frequently found myself talking about something else in front of the patient during the patient's care, which is totally, you know, uh, disrespecting, no. disrespecting the patient and, um, you know, not, not the best uh, way to deal with an unconscious patient. I already mentioned this earlier that the ventilator is only for temporary, okay? As far as whether or not these patients end up in a long-term um, ventilator condition, um, we don't know. I won't have time to finish the, the modes, but I will finish the settings. So next week when we come back, I'll go back to the mode, but today I'll just finish the settings first. I'll go back to those later. All right, settings. <clears throat> so we put the patient on a mechanical ventilator. The ventilator has to know, well, what do you want me to do? So you put settings there. First setting is the tidal volume. The symbol on the vent is capital letter V, small letter T. Tidal volume is the air that, the um, this is the amount of air delivered by the vent for each breath. The formula is between six and eight milli mls per kilogram some hospitals use the height because for me that really makes more sense because the patient's lung is not really determined by your weight is it meaning if you compare a four foot eight patient who also weighs 200 pounds maybe to a six foot four patient who has a bigger but only weighs the same 200 um, kilograms. Who has likely to have a bigger lung? The taller one. The taller one, right? Yeah, Which makes more sense. But I mean, uh, what do I know? Um, most hospitals use the weight. So they use between 6 and 8 milli m mLs per kilogram. Most people, most patients you see, they'll have a tidal volume of about 400. Um, however, that's only the order though. So the doctor orders, let's say, 400 mLs of tidal volume. That doesn't mean that the patient will receive 400 because how much the patient receives will depend on their lung compliance. Lung compliance, again, refers to the stiffness or the softness of the lung. So if the patient has a very bad lung, they may not receive the ordered tidal volume. Any question on that? So on the screen, when you look at the ventilator screen, you will see on top the tidal volume, which is ordered. And then right next to it, you'll see how much did the act patient actually receive. Okay, so you'll see the order or the setting, and then right next to it, you'll see the actual tidal volume. So if you see that the tidal volume is getting less and less, that means what's happening, what the patient's receiving is getting less and less. What's happening to the patient's lung compliance? Is it increasing or decreasing? Can you repeat the question, please? Okay. 
So again, there's uh, the tile volume, there will be an order tile volume. Right next to it, you'll see how much the patient actually received. If the patient's actual received tidal volume goes, goes lower and lower, what's happening to the patient's lung compliance? Is it getting better or is it getting worse? Worse. It's getting worse, meaning the patient, patient's lungs are getting stiffer and stiffer. Next setting is the rate or the frequency. So you will either see rate on the vent monitor or you'll see a symbol of F. F frequency or rate is the same. The vent also has to know, well, how many times do you want me to deliver this tidal volume? So we already put tidal volume. The vent now knows how much air to give for each breath. And then now it knows how many times it's going to deliver that tidal volume. So the setting is usually 10 and 14. Now next week when we go to the mode, the reason why this is not normal, meaning it's not 12 to 20, it's a little bit lower, 10 and 14. Um, and it's only one number, so it's not a range. So the, 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 the rate or the frequency might either be 10, 11, 12, 13, or even 14. The reason is the patient is allowed to take a spontaneous breath, meaning the patients on the floor that you see are breathing on their own also in between ventilator delivered breaths. The only persons that are totally not breathing are those in the OR who are receiving mechanical ventilation because they're having general anesthesia. All other patients, no matter how bad, do get a, do give a spontaneous breath. That's why, because if we put this to 20, for instance, and the patient takes a breath, what happens to your total breaths per minute? Increase. Right, and then a patient ends up with hyperventilation. So that's why to account for that, we put it anywhere between 10 or 14, depending on the patient's condition. Next is FiO2. This is the concentration of oxygen delivered with each breath. We always start at the lowest, which is 21. 21 is the air that we are breathing right now. That's the FiO2 of room air, 21%. So we start at 21% and then you can go higher. We really don't want to use 100% oxygen for long periods of time because that not only will the patient develop oxygen toxicity, but the patient may have lung collapse as well. I'll explain all that again uh, later next week. So uh, we prefer to put the patient in a uh, lower FiO2. So 21% is good. We can go 42 if needed uh, occasionally, okay? But uh, FiO2 of 100 should only be used for maybe one or two hours, right? Never put them on that FiO2 longer. And the doctor is aware of that, of course, but sometimes we forget if the patient's conditions go bad. <clears throat> Next is peak airway pressure. Now, if I were to illustrate this, okay, this is peak airway pressure. Now, imagine this is zero pressure, and this line is zero pressure. Uh, same thing here. So when we take a normal breath, uh, we are negative pressure ventilators because we have the diaphragm. So the diaphragm contracts down and then air is sucked in into our lungs passively. So we go pressure. If we were to measure that pressure right before the breath, when the diaphragm contracts, it will suck in air. So the pressure really goes down and then go back to zero. Okay, so again, next breath, uh, five to six seconds later, negative first. 
time and then next breath. Okay, so this pressure here is called the peak inspiratory um, pressure or also called peak airway pressure. So this is the uh, maximum pressure of air that your lung can accommodate, meaning uh, it, in, in the thoracic cavity, it will look like this. So this is your lung. So this is Miss Lamo. Okay, so this is Miss Lamo's heart. These are her lungs. At the peak inspiratory pressure right here, that means her lungs are inflated to capacity. Okay, so this is the highest pressure during her respirations. And then this is the lower pressure right here, which is zero at the end of the inhalation. That means during PIP, both of these lungs, number one, number two, are hyperinflated. So therefore, they are squeezing the heart for about 0 0.2 seconds, maybe. So that means during that period, your superior and your inferior vena cava are squeezed as well. No problem. It only lasts for about 0 0.2 seconds. That's, that's not a long time at all. So it wouldn't affect cardiac output at all. Because although the return will drop, but it's only for 0 0.2 seconds, no big deal. However, if you add, um, <coughs> uh, well, what, what point am I? Okay, I'll, I'll continue shortly. Okay, so hold that thought here for now. So that is uh, peak airway pressure or peak inspiratory pressure. So it's the highest pressure uh, during uh, when when the when the vent delivers a breath, okay. So th this is the pressure used by the ventilator to deliver a set tidal volume at a given lung compliance. So the doctor sets that PIP. Now that PIP will of course will have to be lowered if the patient's lung compliance decreases. So the doctor makes that adjustment. <clears throat> so here, trends in the PIP, because the ventilator can measure the patient's peak airway pressure. If that goes <clears throat> lower, of course, that will trigger a, an alarm. So that means if it's triggered, meaning the, the ventilator is meeting higher and higher resistance to deliver the breath at the set peak airway pressure, then it's having difficulty doing that because the, the lungs ha are, are putting up so much resistance or pressure, then of course that will trigger the increase of the high pressure alarm. And then depending on how many times that thing is going off, then you report that to the doctor, which will tell him that you know, the lungs, the patient's lungs are becoming stiffer and stiffer and harder and harder to inflate. So he has to make adjustments to the peak airway pressure. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> now CPAP. CPAP, this CPAP here is a setting on the vent. This is not a CPAP machine, meaning the ventilator can function as a CPAP, meaning it has a setting, the vent has a setting in it, making it a CPAP. So if it's turned on, if the CPAP setting is on, that means the vent function is off. This is only used as a weaning setting, meaning if we are weaning the patient, so here, the CPAP is commonly used to help in the weaning process. So the ventilator here stops giving breaths. Instead, it's only giving pressure support. Okay, it's only functioning as a CPAP, meaning we only do this, of course, if we are weaning a patient, meaning you can't have this on a patient who is not breathing effectively. So we are only using CPAP setting as a weaning method. Okay. Uh, of course, when we're doing that, the patient is off sedation because otherwise they can't do normal uh, spontaneous breathing. 
right? So the part of the weaning process is we take them off sedation also. Now the CPAP is anywhere between that number. Okay, that's the pressure on the CPAP that you will deliver. Next is positive expiratory end pressure. <clears throat> now let's go back to the joint. Uh, first of all, what is this? So this is a positive pressure exerted at the end of expiration. Uh, no, during expiration. If you remember the illustration earlier, the purpose of this is to keep the patient, the patient's lung inflated, meaning we don't want the patient's lung to collapse. Okay, and the other purpose of, of this is to, um, to avoid the need for high FiO2. Um, so instead of giving the patient more oxygen, why not give more pressure during uh, exhalation? Okay, so that will of course eliminate the need for uh, more oxygen. Does that make sense? So instead of increasing your um, co oxygen concentration, why not just um, keeping, why not just try to keep the oxygen in there longer? Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, let me uh, illustrate. So back here. Okay, remember we said, um, the pressure at the end of exhalation goes to zero right here. All right. It's also the same on a vent. So let's say this is the vent giving the breath. So we'll know it's the vent because it doesn't go negative like here. This one goes negative below zero. If a, if a vent is delivering a breath, it stays, it starts at zero, goes up like this. Right, and then it goes up again, next, next breath. All right. We know it's given by the vent because it doesn't go negative. It's going to start from zero up because the vent is a positive pressure ventilator. So this is what you'll see on the screen. You'll see that the patient is taking a breath if it goes negative. So those negative starts are spontaneous breaths coming from the patient. So now if you add heat, the patient's end expiratory pressure no longer goes to zero like this one's here. It will now go when it stops here, uh, it stops above zero. So this is, let's say that's five centimeters of water. If it's higher, let's say 15, you go higher like this. That's, let's say 15. And then so on. If it's higher, there it is, 20. All right. Now, the important thing to remember is what is it doing if it's, if it's giving PEEP? PEEP is okay if it's between 5 and 15 centimeters of water. Because remember what I said about venous return earlier? Because now, if you put PEEP higher, let's say 20 centimeters of water, that means, do the lungs ever completely empty? I mean, do, they, do their pressures in there completely go to zero? No. No, because you added PEEP. They no longer completely empty. They no longer go back to zero. They will stay at either 5, 10, 15, or even 20. That means the lungs will stay inflated the, at the end of exhalation instead of going to zero. Now, what's the implication here on the heart? If these lungs do not give the heart a break, meaning they stay inflated even at the end of expiration, doesn't go to zero pressure, what happens to venous return? Because that means the heart is now going to be compressed or squeezed for an extended period of time, what could happen to venous return and therefore what will happen to cardiac output? Cardiac output decrease and to venous right. return. Right. Output. Eventually, it's going to catch up with the heart. So the longer you use PEEP, uh, 
I'm only referring to a really high peep. Again, five to 15 centimeters of water won't probably affect Venus return that much, but once you go higher than that, then the, there will be a noticeable uh, decrease in Venus return and therefore a noticeable cardiac output um, decrease here the longer you use PEEP. However, PEEP again is beneficial because the lungs as stated here PEEP will prevent alveoli from collapsing because the lungs are kept partially inflated. The effect would be an increase in PaO2 so that FiO2 can be decreased. Okay, as long as it's between 5 and 15, that shouldn't have any significant effect on cardiac output. But the higher the PEEP, then of course the higher the decrease in venous return, therefore, the higher the decrease in cardiac output. Um, flow rate, and then that will be it for today. Flow rate is the speed. You know how when you drive a car, you're running at a certain speed, 50 miles an hour, 60 miles an hour. So it's the same thing here. How fast do you want the vent to deliver the breath? The usual setting is about 400 liters per minute. That is only the speed. This is not referring to the amount of oxygen the patient receives. Is that clear? This is not meaning that the patient is receiving 40, 40 liters a minute. This is only the speed. And that's it. Any questions? All right, so we'll continue next week.